Hi, my name is Dr. Daryl Gebian. I'm an emergency department physician who trained in the United States and currently living in Toronto, where I'm originally from. The purpose of this video is to bring uh, healthcare providers and the general public up to speed about the COVID-19 crisis because so much information is happening so quickly, it's hard to keep track of all the information that's been coming in and it's overwhelming, really. Um, we've all had all this time off and to just become immersed in all the news that's been coming through and it um, can be quite unsettling and difficult to kind of keep perspective on what's been happening and trying not to lose the plot because of all the time spent um, indoors. So. I wanted to make myself useful uh, to the public because currently I'm not practicing. Uh, that's for another video some other time. But I wanted to do my part and to try to provide a summary video that gives the, some background um, about the coronavirus and COVID-19, to uh, discuss the epidemiology or the statistics going on, uh, to discuss the clinical features of how people are presenting in hospital, uh, the treatment and then prevention of COVID-19. Uh, discuss a little bit about social isolation and why it's important, or self-quarantine, and then two special situations, uh, particularly for healthcare providers, uh, per pertinent information for them, and also to discuss a little bit of the conspiracy theories and um, how to avoid scams. Now, I'm qualified to give this talk. I think the main reason, and not just because I'm a, I'm a doctor, but it's because emergency physicians are very well versed and have a lot of practice in uh, taking lots of information and being able to sift out the most important facts and and also not to uh, get caught up in what is garbage in and garbage out, meaning avoid questionable data. It's really important to look at high quality data. So all the information that I'm presenting to you is coming from reputable news sources, things like the CDC, National Institutes of Health, um, the World Health Organization and Public Health Canada. Uh, this is targeted for the general public and also for healthcare professionals. Uh, I like to think that one of the arts that we need to learn in the practice of emergency medicine is to be able to translate complex information for anybody to understand. And uh, I'm going to do my best to try to do that without getting too technical. Okay, so um, I'm going to get started now. So the background on coronaviruses and the meaning of the word pandemic versus epidemic. So a pandemic is worse than an epidemic. That's just the easiest way to remember it. A pandemic means across the, the population, whereas epi is within. Now, epidemic goes to the Greek epidemios, with, which means within the country, among the people. And pandemic means of all the people. So that can help explain that, and that we are currently in a COVID-19 pandemic, which is the worst one. Coronaviruses are known for uh, SARS and both Middle East Respiratory Syndromes. These are highly uh, contagious infectious diseases that have already happened, and, but neither one, fortunately, really hit hard in the population. Now, we all know that's not the case with coronavirus right now with COVID-19. Coronaviruses are enveloped RNA viruses with a crown-like appearance. This is what it looks like on electron microscopy. And you can see that there is a halo effect, the darkness around the viral virus particles there, that's what is mean by the corona. And um, that pro the shadow is created by certain glycoproteins which stick out of the, uh, the virus's uh, wall. So they belong to a family known as nidovirales, nidovirales, uh, viruses that replicate using a nested set of RNA um, nucleic acids. So the other thing to look at here is that's the center part here. So this is a vi virus that we're looking at, the protein on the outside, and then we see that there is the nucleocapsid where the nuclear material is kept in the middle. So uh, it's a really nice quality computer gener generated image there. So there's four genuses or genera of um, coronaviruses, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma, and alpha and beta are both known to infect humans. Um, all four of them are um, zoonotic, meaning that they can be transferred from other animals, generally mammals, to uh, human beings. Uh, coronaviruses primarily infect birds and mammals, uh, as well as bats being host to a variety of genotypes. And this is where we get into the next topic in a minute. So um, most coronaviruses historically cause an upper respiratory infection, meaning sore throat, runny nose. Rarely do these come, go into the lower airways, causing bronchitis and then pneumonia. And this is important because that's what's going on, respond, the main responsible cause of death currently with this version of coronavirus. So it's very unusual that they're affecting the lower airways. Um, and it's pretty much obvious in a person. We'll get to the symptoms later. Coronaviruses are ubiquitous, meaning they're everywhere. Uh, they're year-round in the tropics and subtropics, and they're seasonal in the temperate climates, occurring most often in the wintertime. Now, COVID-19 has its origins in China. This is a wet market, and uh, it's an interesting name for a produce market 
these are already slaughtered animals, but you can see in this first image um, what the problem is, and that is there's no ice, no refrigeration. This is raw chicken sitting out and just sitting prone for salmonella, uh, which is common and tolerated amongst the population in some places in China. So that's what typically is seen at a wet market, but this is what's unusual. This is a not a non-doctored image, and this shows a bat. Um, exotic animals are slaughtered here and sold for consumption. This is the origin. It's already been proven that the first few cases that came into Wuhan, China, when they did swabs on these people and sent it off for PCR, which is a polymerase chain reaction, uh, it's a very quick way of amplifying DNA in a sample. So you take a swab from the, th the nose or throat of this person, you collect, you collect all the DNA of the person and the bacteria or viruses that are uh, in the swab, and it's amplified. So tiny, minute amounts of DNA can be actually measured and seen later on. And it was quickly discovered that this was a, a new or novel coronavirus um, that was subsequently labeled COVID-19. Uh, so it's very quickly, thankfully, to the uh, Chinese CDC to pick up uh, the cause of this unusual illness is that people were falling very sick, requiring mechanical ventilation in disproportionate numbers. Uh, COVID-19 is um, it spreads much more readily than SARS and has gone way beyond the numbers of SARS, SARS numbers. Just a little bit of epidemiology now. So just to go back now, at the end of December, this is when the five patients uh, with respiratory distress were hospitalized. Uh, one of them died at that point. The tests were done. It took a very short period of time to uh, to test them and figure out that this was COVID-19. Um, and within three days, 41 patient, patients were admitted. By uh, 20 days later, there's 571 cases, uh, 7,824 by January 30th, so that's eight days later. And by mid-February, two weeks later, uh, it had gone up from 170 deaths to 1,666 deaths. In total, by March 23rd, there was 81,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in China, of which 3,270 died. Uh, the case fatality rate, looking at the number of people who died compar compared to those confirmed, was 2.2%. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to say that this rate has come down uh, amongst, uh, across the planet now, particularly in the United States and Canada. Uh, the median age of COVID-19 patients was 45 years of age, and the median age of death was uh, 75 years, with a range of 48 to 89 years. So this is affecting younger people, but the median, the halfway point, um, of people in the, all the age uh, brackets was 75 years. So this does affect people from an older age group, which we all know from the news. So I just want to look at the, some of the statistics here. And, and the, um, in the very beginning, uh, the number of cases just completely grew exponentially in China. Now, this next one uh, shows uh, what this is a linear scale and what had happened uh, over a case of about two months. Uh, it skyrockets in the beginning, it is exponential, and then it starts slowing down. This coincides with this graph which shows the active, sorry, the new cases that are coming in daily that came in China. Now, in this graph, we can see that there's a bell curve. It goes up and then, fortunately, it's going down. So that's a very good sign that over approximately a two-month period, they had a massive amount of people presenting with COVID-19, and then it tapered off. So that is good news. That's what we are looking for in other parts of the world. The number of deaths in China as well also... Uh, started tapering off it was exponential at first and then starts slowing down so that's what this graphic shows these are all courtesy of worldometer.com now the next one is the active cases so again this is a bell curve and it shows that the number of people going up who are actively having the disease and then going down now this is what we mean by flattening the curve flattening the curve is over time reducing the number of active people with the disease at that moment in time so in china there's the blue curve which it goes up first but what the idea of self-isolation is, it's not reducing the number of people infected, but rather it's skewing it and pushing it so that, the, so that there's not so many people presenting at one particular time with active disease. So that way we're not getting, our healthcare systems are not being overwhelmed. So the, the purple in this diagram shows just what I drew on this graph of what self-isolation can do, and it can help skew it to the right. Italy tragic here. So this is before self-isolation. And we can see in this next graph, there's just complete exponential growth here of the number of cases uh, of coronavirus. Correspondingly, the number of deaths here, it has surpassed 6,000 at the time of this, uh, my talk right now today, it's uh, at the end of March 23rd, 2020. And uh, it is still exponential, the growth going on in Italy. Uh, but my latest research is showing that the rate in which uh, this is increasing is actually decreasing. So the rate in which people are dying from COVID-19 in Italy is starting to slow down. Here's the encouraging graph right here. So this is, again, the active cases uh, per day in Italy over time. And the red arrow is showing that over the last two days that there's been a decrease, finally, uh, in Italy of the numbers of people presenting with COVID-19. 
United States, again, I've been collecting this information from the CDC and Worldometer. Uh, currently in the U.S., there's 46,000 cases that are confirmed COVID positive, 19, uh, COVID-19. Uh, this has tripled over the last three days. And um, the good news is that the case fatality rate is down to 1.3%. So 582 of this 46,000 uh, died, unfortunately, but the rate is much lower than what happened in China and Italy. It's uh, currently 1.3, and let's hope it stays that way. In Canada, uh, the incidence numbers shows 1.5%. So of the people getting tested, so this is already a skewed statistic, but of the people getting tested, 1.5% have been positive for COVID-19. So that's encouraging as well that it is, the numbers are not nearly as high as 20 to 30 to 40% uh, as estimated as the prevalence in the population. Uh, the, in the provinces of Canada, uh, Ontario has been hit the worst. Uh, unfortunately, the number of deaths has settled down at only six at this point. And in the world, uh, the case fatality rate, just by comparison, is 4.3%. There's been 382,000 cases with 16.5,000 cases that have died, and that's how I got 4.3%. Um, uh, most notably as well, though, uh, of all the cases in the world, 95% are mild. So I don't want to instill fear. Uh, that is an quite the opposite. That's an encouraging number. And I'll say it again, 95% of people who've been diagnosed with COVID-19 have mild disease. So clinical features, um, it's from person to person transmission and um, there's two ways of this happening. One is through direct contact, the, the virus can get on inanimate uh, surfaces and they can s reside there for days if not weeks. And uh, that can be touched and picked up by somebody else who's not infected and then should they touch their face, um, they can contract the virus so easily that way. That's one of the problems about COVID-19 is it's highly infectious. Uh, the other way is through respiratory droplets. So a person sneezing or coughing, it gets in the air uh, for a short period of time before it settles down onto the ground. But um, those respiratory droplets are highly contagious. And that's why we see healthcare providers wearing N95 masks, uh, gowns and, and face masks, uh, face shields as well. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, healthcare providers are still 3% in China got, did contract COVID-19 despite um, personal protection devices. And uh, my feeling is because it's, it's through uh, direct contact with inanimate objects and then self-infecting. Just to add to it is that th there's also likely fecal oral transmission here as well. Uh, fecally, it's already been proven the virus, virus has been confirmed uh, in the feces of COVID-19 positive patients. Uh, and it is quite likely at this point that it can be fecal oral transmission, which is typical of most diarrheal illnesses. Good news is that in a small study uh, conducted on COVID-19 positive women in their third trimester, there was no evidence of transmission to the fetus. So that is excellent news. The other piece of excellent news is that children, for whatever reason, it's unknown at this point, uh, they are tolerating it very well. There's been no uh, serious cases that I've read of uh, where children are getting um, severely clinically infected. They, they are getting COVID-19, but they're not falling uh, ill to it. And the reasons could be that they have conferred immunity from some other bug, uh, perhaps another coronavirus or something else that they've uh, picked up in their childhood that's made them immune to COVID-19. So that's really good news. And that's where the future research needs to go as far as vaccines are, are produced. The incubation period has been shown to be about four days. So this, this means that a person can contract the virus, have it, but not present with any symptoms. Um, it takes about four days for them to develop symptoms. So this is where the problem is and why it's needed for self-isolation because a person is capable of infecting others during this four-day period and they're completely asymptomatic and have no idea that they have it. And that's why this virus is so successful at um, propagating through the population. The period of from the onset of COVID-19 symptoms to death ranged from 6 to 41 days with a median of 14 days. So once a person presents with symptoms related to COVID-19, things like, we'll get to in a minute, but things like cough, shortness of breath, um, fevers, there is generally about 14 days before they die. That means, it sounds tragic, but that means there's 14 days that a person could get medical attention. Seeing reports of people who are just keeling over and, uh, and perishing from this is highly unusual. Usually there'll be symptoms and that's respiratory symptoms. Um, the good news is that the spectrum of infection ranges from asymptomatic, as I just said, to mild and then to critical, and most infections are not severe. Uh, of for tests that have been done so far, studies, 81% were mild, 14% severe, and 5% were critical, where they required uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation in the ICU. Uh, in Wuhan, China, uh, there was a study of 138 patients with COVID-19 pneumonia, and this is where the symptoms were first um, delivered to the world. In 99% of them, there was fever, and 70% fatigue. 60% dry cough, 40% uh, anorexia, which means loss of appetite, uh, muscle aches and cramps were involved, shortness of breath, and then sputum production in 27%, some of which had hemoptysis, which is blood streak sputum. Um, most fatal cases in China happen with patients with advanced age, over the age of 70, and with underlying 
medical conditions or comorbidities. This includes uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic lung disease, uh, long-standing uncontrolled high blood pressure, and cancer within the last five years. In fact, it was shown that there was, um, of people who died from COVID-19, 30% had ischemic heart disease, 22% had a history of atrial fibrillation, 73% had a history of high blood pressure, uh, active cancer was at 20% in the last five years, and 20% had a history of chronic renal failure. So what that means is the people who are passing away generally have other concurrent medical problems. The next graph I want to show uh, shows the um, age distribution of those who uh, presented with COVID-19 in China. And you can see in this graph that uh, there's a major spike in numbers from the ages, above, uh, ages between 70 and 89 years of age. And unusually, uh, it affects men just about twice as, twice as many men died compared to women. Uh, again, this needs to be explored why that is. The main outcome, main cause of death with with COVID-19 is that the people are contracting pneumonia, first of all. Then the known pneumonia goes unchecked, unfortunately, and uh, this can progress to, the, to bilateral infiltrates, which is bilateral congestion, severe congestion in the lungs on both sides. And that impairs air exchange, including oxygen and, and carbon dioxide. Now, this is what it looks like. This is a chest x-ray. And in this image, um, you can see for the healthcare providers out there, there's com and, and non, there's complete whiteout of the lungs here. So normally you could see the heart border in a healthy x-ray, healthy chest x-ray, but in this one it's just complete whiteout of both lung fields, you cannot see the border of the heart. This is severe pneumonia, and actually it's worse than that. This is edema as well, so swelling in the lungs. This is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, this is what it looks like on a chest x-ray and on a CAT scan. The CAT scan is the picture on the right, and that shows fluid-filled lungs as well uh, with bilateral diffuse pulmonary infiltration. Now the person in this situation, what they would look like is very sick. They would, at this point, they're already on a ventilator and intubated, meaning they have a breathing tube uh, in their airway. And because this person, if they didn't have those, these medical necessities, they would pass away um, in a short period of time. So it's respiratory failure that's the main cause of death. Testing of um, coronavirus, we all know now that it's a swab. It's called a nasopharyngeal swab. It's inserted through the nose, into the back of the, of the nasal passages, into the throat. And that's where the bacteria like to live and uh, can be picked up quite easily. This is sent for uh, PCR testing, as I mentioned before. So this is reverse transcriptase PCR. And it is uh, fortunately being the turnaround time is getting shorter and shorter. Right now in, in Canada, sorry, in Ontario, where I live, it's four days apparently. But uh, I know there's tests on the, out in the United States that have a 24-hour period turnaround. So this is really important um, in public health reporting and letting the patient know, obviously. Treatment. Uh, so at this point, there are no specific antiviral drugs or vaccines. Uh, that's going to change soon. Um, on a first study done of only 20 patients in Wuhan, China, it was picked up, and we know about this because Donald Trump uh, mentioned it, and uh, now the world understands what is hydroxychloroquine, which is an, typically an anti-malarial drug, but it can also be used as an antiviral. Uh, they discovered that by giving both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, which is a typical antibiotic, that there was a significant reduction of the virus that's being shed in, in their airways and being shed uh, fecally. So um, that is a very good sign. So it's not correlated to clinical improvement. That's the limitation of the study. But what it was showing is that there's less virus uh, over um, the, the duration of this test and that people who had the virus, there was a shorter duration, shorter time in which they were positive with the virus. So that was very encouraging. And I can understand that even with the clinical trials at this point, when you have people on their deathbed, give them whatever you can. And that's what's been going on, not for all people, but people who are gravely ill. They're, most healthcare providers, from what I've read and learned, is that hydroxychloroquine is being reserved for those patients only. But the studies still need to come out. They need to find out when is it most useful? What's the appropriate dose? Uh, is it causing any harm? Like chloroquine, the predecessor to hydroxychloroquine, for example, caused, it's very well known that it caused major side effects, but that's fortunately not the case with hydroxy. Uh, the, the major side effects include retinal damage and damage to the eyes. Another study, um, and these are preliminary from the Chinese authorities, it was suggested that um, 100 infected patients treated with chloroquine experienced a rapid decline in fever and improvement of, of uh, lung findings seen on chest CAT scan. So, and they also required a shorter time to recover compared with control groups. So this is a higher quality study, and there was, it was without any obvious serious adverse effects. So that's very good news. The studies are currently being done in Italy. We're going to get that information very soon. Um, there's more, to, more here as well. So there's also an antiretroviral drugs. One of them is called remdesivir, and this is also um, being used experimentally. And this has already been out for a while, so the safety, has already been, safety profile has already been determined that it's uh, relatively safe to give to patients. And this is already showing that remdesivir is helping people. So 
Uh, these drugs are still in early stages, but they are going to try to bring them out as quick as possible and expedite uh, the, the um, safety profiling through uh, the FDA. Now, there's also a, a part I need to cover here about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, early reports came out that these drugs were causing harm in some patients or reducing um, a person's ability to recover from COVID-19. Uh, this information is very weak and poor. So when I say NSAIDs or non-steroidals, that's referring to ibuprofen and naproxen. These are very well-known painkillers. Um, now, I cannot give medical advice, and that's not the purpose of this talk, but I just want to dispel people's anxiety that the information that came in was low quality, that this was causing harm. I do not believe it to be true. Um, over This will be studied further over the next couple of weeks, but I do not think uh, that that is a cause for concern, and it has been recommended uh, in Europe um, from the European Medicine Agency that people who, and the World Health Organization, that um, they recommend people to continue taking their non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So just needed to get that out of the way. Prevention. So vaccines, unfortunately, they're still not out yet. Um, they're in phase one trials. Um, the idea is uh, to produce an mRNA ribonucleic acid, which is uh, mimics the um, genetic material of the virus itself. Uh, and the idea is to mimic actually an extracellular protein that's produced. So when I showed that slide before about the glycoproteins and the extracellular envelope of the virus, that is what we're mimicking in a vaccine to stimulate the immune system to produce antibodies that are sensitive to the shape, the three-dimensional shape of this particular protein. The idea is to trigger the immune, body's immune system and to produce a long-term immunity against real infection. Um, originally, they're saying it would be about a year for this to be out, but I have a feeling this will be expedited and be out in the next several months. So the other way to prevent this uh, is uh, just a word on cleaning and disinfecting. Those are two separate things. So cleaning is actually soap and water, cleaning up any uh, potential areas in your house. Uh, soap and water still works fine for viruses. Now, disinfecting is different. This takes diff uh, more, more chemicals are involved with this, but fortunately, there's household cleaners that can be used, and this includes uh, diluted household bleach, uh, as well as alcohol solutions with at least 70% alcohol. And there's plenty of uh, EPA-registered household disinfectants. Now, I have a list here, and I will publish them. On, these are web links for in both the United States and Canada to check out by either your EPA number of the product or the DIN number, the drug identification number in Canada. And you can actually look up to see if your household cleaner is has been tested and and um, helpful in cleaning up coronavirus. Uh, but the, the main drugs that I, the main um, cleaners that I saw on this list included Clorox, Lysol, scrubbing bubbles, my favorite, Fantastic, Virox, and more. So if you follow the links, which I'm going to provide, then uh, you can look up to see if yours is in the list. The other prevention here, and we've heard all about this now, is self-isolation. Now, the whole idea is that we want to slow down the transmission of disease uh, by, uh, p by having social isolation so people are not infecting others. This is the simplest way and the most effective way, and it is incredibly important. The idea is we do not want to overwhelm our healthcare systems. That is total danger because there's a limited number of ventilators out there. That's the bottom line. So let's not be selfish. Let's do our part for our communities. Let's care about our communities and stay indoors and minimize how much exposure you have out in the population. Not necessary to wear a mask when you're in public unless you have symptoms. Uh, and in that situation, uh, we see surgical masks, but there's actually something called N95 respirators, which are the uh, the bigger ones that cover the face and are generally circular in shape, whereas surgical masks are more the rectangular. And do me a favor. I keep seeing people who don't pinch the nose piece. Pinch the nose piece. That's the part that keeps... Um, air, your exhaled air from getting out and, um, and infecting other people. So there's a metal piece in it. You don't see it, but you can feel it. Pinch your nose, please. Self-isolate. What does it mean? So for 14 days, you need to stay at home and monitor yourself, yourself for symptoms, even if mild, to avoid contact with other people, to help prevent the transmission of the virus at the earliest stages of illness, and to do your part to prevent the spread of disease in your home and your community in case you develop symptoms. So you're monitoring yourself. If you develop symptoms, the ones I mentioned above, that's when to seek medical attention and to be tested. <clears throat> now, when should home isolation be dis discontinued? Uh, it depends on whether a person has been, been tested or not for COVID-19. When a person has not been tested, then at least seven days have passed. They can discontinue home isolation when seven days have passed since symptoms first appeared, and there's been at least three days of passing since recovery of the last symptom. For people who've been tested, the main thing is to have resolution of fever and to have respiratory improvement in their symptoms and to have two consecutive nasopharyngeal swab testing negative. Future directions. Um, fecal and urine samples can potentially serve as reservoirs of infection here. So this needs to be tested to see, uh, and my feeling is considering how infective this is, how contagious it is, that it's likely that it's more than just uh, respiratory droplets and more than... Um, 
uh, on inanimate objects uh, for direct contact. I have a feeling that there's fecal oral transmission here and possibly even urine. So this is highly contagious. It'll be interesting to see on um, the studies uh, if this novel coronavirus is being transmitted that way. The other interesting thing to look up is pediatric cases. Why are they not being af inf uh, affected clinically nearly as bad as elderly? And to see perhaps there's something in it, uh, the, p the pediatric children's immune system that is lost over time uh, with adults. So further studies need to happen uh, in that area. And why is it some people are as as completely asymptomatic, uh, whereas others have full-blown symptoms? What is different? What's going on in, in their immune systems? So these things can be tested and studied, but it's going to take some time. So there's two special situations I wish to discuss. This one is set for healthcare providers. First of all, thank you to all my brothers and sisters who are out there practicing in the trenches selflessly and taking care of patients. It must be horrible to see what's happening to people and to hear about healthcare providers uh, contracting COVID-19 and wondering about your own safety when you get, go into that patient's room. But just rest assured knowing that you are heroes. We are proud of you. I am proud of you uh, for being there at the front lines. So healthcare providers in China, an estimated 3,000 healthcare workers were infected and at least 22 died. This is in a massive population though. Amongst the um, 40, roughly 45,000 cases in China, a total of 3.8% were healthcare workers who were infected. And uh, but, uh, so it's 1,700 people and 1,000 of them were in Wuhan, China. So a very disproportionate number in Wuhan, China in the early stages of this infection, of this pandemic. Since then, enhanced hygiene and surface decontamination have been paramount, and these have been instituted across the board in all healthcare settings in North America um, and Europe. Um, the coronavirus is known to live on surfaces for hours or days, but this can be killed, as I said before, by um, available disinfectants when properly used. The CDC is recommending, and this is a no-brainer, uh, wearing personal protective equipment. So this includes a gown, a face mask, a face shield, gloves, and either an N95 respirator or a, or a powered air purifying respirator. It will lower the incidence of, of uh, contracting COVID-19. In a study of outpatient healthcare personnel in diverse ambulatory practices, medical masks applied both by the patient and the caregiver provided effectively similar protect protection as the N95 mask did. So that's good news. So uh, it's not as good having a surgical mask, but it's, it's much uh, safer than nothing. So it's recommended, uh, and this is again a no-brainer, this has been instituted, but for those physicians who have their own uh, clinics out in the community, just to give them an FYI, place a mask on the patient immediately, uh, give them a box of tissues, uh, encouraging good cough etiquette, uh, coughing into your sleeve or your elbow is even better, or sneezing as well, and providing uh, um, hand hygiene and surface de decontamination uh, immediately when the patient leaves. So those are the little things we can do to get rid of the respiratory and surface uh, contamination. Uh, those who have symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 should be rapidly triaged and separated from the general population, ideally in a well-ventilated space with a distance of at least six feet from others until they can be placed in an isolation room. Uh, so the hospitals have been creative in the emergency departments to have uh, new areas built. I, I've seen one myself here in Toronto at North York General Hospital, and they took over the ambulance space. So very, very clever. Um, healthcare prof professionals, please metac meticulous hand hygiene. Uh, wash your hands so uh, so frequently and for 20 seconds. Avoid contaminating workspaces is, is equally important. Uh, there's certain things that are uh, known to harbor infection. This includes stethoscopes, mobile phones, computer keyboards, dictation devices, landlines, name tags, uh, you name it. Um, and there are hospital-based disinfectants and alcohol-based ones that are there to help uh, clean things up. A word on conspiracy theories. Now, this is just, you know, it's rife with, um, the, the internet is rife with conspiracy theories, and it's truly disappointing. Uh, I mean, people just want to have their five minutes of, of fame, but it's shame. You know, it's really disgusting what I'm seeing. Let me just say uh, straight off, no, this is not uh, warfare. No one, no scientist could come up with COVID-19, no way. And the genetic sequencing that's been done right from the very beginning shows there's no relationship to HIV. There's no sort of meddling with uh, with DNA to produce um, a superbug. That is not what's happening. This is even when you look at historically back in history, it was not too long ago we had SARS and MERS, and then go back before that with Spanish flu. Um, this is historic. This is part of the human existence, is dealing with catastrophic pandemics. Uh, some of the more interesting ones, you know, drink hot soup to uh, stop the coronavirus. No, that's not going to cut it. Gargling ginger water, not going to happen there. That won't get rid of it. Um, eating uh, garlic or ice cream. It's amazing what you see. Uh, just be careful. Just like I said at the beginning of my talk, it's important to look at where this information is coming from, particularly in social media, because it, things can just pass so easily and accept it and then just go viral, no pun intended. Um, so question the quality of information you're getting, your source. We can all do that, and when you're about to, uh, to click on share, think twice. 
There was an interesting statement from public scientists. Uh, this is what they said. We stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. Scientists from multiple countries have published and analyzed genomes of the causative agent, the genome, so the genetic um, map of these of COVID-19. They looked at the severe acute respiratory uh, corona, causing coronavirus, and overwhelmingly, these are scientists, these are experienced people, they overwhelmingly conclude that this originated in wildlife. I'll take that over any bogus um, naysayer or creative uh, person out there who wants to come up with their own version of what this is caused by and the conspiracy theory I will blow holes in it easily okay so that's the end of my talk here so just to summarize it again my name is Dr. Daryl Jordan Gebbian I'm an emergency department physician I discussed about the coronavirus uh, and then COVID-19 discuss the epidemiology uh, the clinical features the most important thing is to present to hospital if you have cough shortness of breath and fever um, and that is the most important thing I think I said in this whole talk though was that 95% of people who are positive for COVID-19 have mild disease so please rest assured we also need to worry about our elderly people over the age of 70 are more highly prone and people who have comorbid disease uh, other have medical health issues so the threshold to bringing these people to hospital should be very low um, the newest treatments for this include um, hydroxychloroquine, which is promising, as well as remdesivir, which is an antiviral medication. These things will come out uh, sooner than later. And uh, for healthcare providers out there, you're doing an amazing job. We're really proud of you. I'm proud of you. And to keep going, but also to take a breath and don't immerse yourself in the news. That's another thing I wanted to say. Don't immerse yourself in the news 24-7. That's bad. It's just bad for mental wellness. Okay, again, thank you very much. Take care.